Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Elliot Ratzman. Uh, I am a Jewish studies professor at Grinnell College in Iowa, and I am writing a book about Jewish anti-racism. Uh, and in that book, I talk about some biblical passages. What I want to do for you today is perhaps answer a question that may have occurred to you or certainly has come up in the history of thinking about especially the Hebrew Bible uh, by some, which is, is the Bible racist? Is some of the origins of racism or all of the origins of racism to be found there in the, in the, in the Bible? Now, uh, the answer is complicated. On one hand, there is a lot of tribal politics with some caricatures of other peoples in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, but on the other hand, those texts from the Hebrew Bible, as you know from your class, are, are very old, written in different contexts, in different periods, and really didn't have much of an international influence in, until the advent of Christianity, which mostly ignores uh, large parts of the Hebrew Bible uh, during its history. What I want to talk to you about today, though, is a curious episode in the Hebrew Bible, uh, which has a very toxic afterlife of interpretation uh, by Christians and some Jews uh, as a justification for uh, anti-Black uh, racism, for uh, Black slavery in the modern period. Um, and this is around the story in the section in Genesis of the, uh, the curse of Ham uh, in the Noah's cycle. So let me... Uh, show you some text and some images. Hold on here a second. So again, I'm Elliot Ratzman. You can always email me with questions and comments, but I will be coming and answering questions to your class soon enough. So uh, we're now going to look at the curse of Ham. Uh, now, as you know from the biblical text, uh, everybody on the, earth, on the earth is wiped out except for Noah uh, and his three sons, Japheth, Ham, and Shem. Uh, these are the only three sons, and later on in the Bible, we're looking at Genesis uh, 9 and 10, uh, they will be described as the progenitors, the ancestors of all the peoples of the world, and, and Genesis makes a few comments about who those peoples are. Now, we've got to remember that the worldview of people living in the Middle East uh, during the Bronze Age is pretty limited. They probably don't know about the peoples of Europe. Um, certainly not Northern Europe, Western Europe. They probably don't know about the peoples of the Far East. Um, they probably have not, uh, do not have any interaction with people uh, outside of, uh, at best, East Africa, parts of East Africa. Um, the, the, the worldview of the Bible is fairly limited. However, in later centuries, uh, Christian uh, Christian explorers, Christian scribes, Christian scholars will believe that the Bible uh, actually describes the entire world, the genealogies of all the peoples of the known world, including eventually Native Americans, Asians, uh, Africans. So uh, we want to keep in mind that the original text probably is just thinking about the descendants and the peoples of the Middle East, so that the descendants of the three sons is fairly limited. Um, now, we're going to look here at the curse of Ham. Um, it does not say in your Bible anywhere, the curse of Ham. Of course, this is an episode we are going to attribute to. And actually, the description, the curse of Ham, may be a problem. Now, if you all watch that Noah film, you know that, that Ham seems to be up to no good there. Uh, and that's true in the biblical text. Okay, so here's uh, Genesis 9. This is the NIV translation. Uh, the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the whole earth. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, we're reminded here he's the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two, bro and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked in 
backwards and covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned uh, uh, the other way so they would not see their father naked. Okay, so what you have here, uh, and you remember this episode from the um, Noah film, uh, Noah gets drunk. It's interesting because when that film came out, some evangelical Christians said, how could the decadent Hollywood depict Noah as a drunkard? Um, well, it might help to read the actual biblical text to see this is an episode in the story. So, but back to our, our episode here, uh, the two sons are being dutiful, uh, have some humility over the embarrassing moment of their father being drunk. Uh, Ham, however, seems to be making fun of him. Um, in the Jewish tradition, there's a longer, richer lore around what Ham actually does to his father, which we'll not talk about today. That's another conversation. But here, uh, it seems to be a maybe a little parable about uh, filial piety, that you should be respectful of the father even when he's drunk, and that the two brothers are doing the respectful thing. Now, look what happens when Noah, on verse 24, when Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his younger son, youngest son had done to him, he said, curse be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. He also said, praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend Japheth's territory. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. Now, what's going on here? Uh, I thought you said, Ratzman, this is the curse of Ham. But it looks like, you see in verse 24, the beginning of the curse, uh, Canaan gets cursed. Now, we know Canaan is the son of Ham. The text has noted this twice already. Um, but it's really odd. So let's highlight the parts where Canaan is mentioned. Um, Ham was the father of Canaan. Ham was the father of Canaan. Uh, and then the curse, instead of being the curse of Ham, it's the curse of Canaan. Why is this? Now, uh, a traditional Jewish lore tries to explain this, what looks like a glitch uh, with elaborate storytelling uh, and rationale. But for Christian readers, uh, that elaborate Midrashic storytelling is not available. Um, and, but it still is confounding. Uh, it says Canaan will be a slave to his brothers, but we don't know who the brothers are. They're not mentioned yet. Um, but then in verse 26, is it may Canaan be the slave of Shem? In verse 27, may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. But Canaan's not the brother of Shem or Japheth, it's Ham. So what looks like, this is uh, my speculation here, is that originally the story is about the cursing of, the, of, of Ham and that it's like somebody took a black Sharpie, crossed out Ham and wrote in Canaan. Uh, wrote in was the father of Canaan. Um, now this is speculation, we can't know for sure, but the curse would make a lot more logical sense if Ham was the immediate recipient of the curse, since Ham is the person that uh, disobeyed, or let's say dishonored his father, and also that he is the brother of Shem and the brother of Japheth. So that would make sense of the curse. Now, if I'm right, uh, and that Ham was the original recipient of this curse, um, then there's, uh, question, why is it that somebody took a marker, um, metaphorically crossed out Ham, put in Canaan? Well, these texts are ways of are being written, edited, circulated around the time in which there is Israelite domination of the Canaanite people in the Holy Land. So what you're looking at here is a sort of origin story about where the Canaanites came from. The Canaanites have an ancestor named Canaan, and he was uh, cursed, according to this text that we have, uh, to be a slave to his brothers. Uh, the brothers, Japheth and Shem, become the ancestors of other peoples, Shem being the ancestor of the Israelites. So what you're looking at is, is an origin story, a justification for uh, Canaanite subordination. Um, meanwhile, Ham has sort of dropped out of the picture. 
Now, if you believe in the integrity of the Bible, that it comes to us as it should be coming to us, or that this, that this is how it was originally told or written or from God's uh, you know, voice to, to Moses's uh, chisel, uh, then you'll have fun trying to work out the contradictions here. But let's go with my theory here for a second, is that this story was uh, amended to make it about the, curse, the cursed nature of Canaan and explains why the Canaanites are in a subordinate position to um, the Israelites at the time. All right, now my speculations aside, this story seems to be about Canaan and Canaanites. What, the, what happens though, centuries later, is that this story gets used by Christians and Jews uh, to justify African slavery. And they use several ways of understanding this. First, uh, when you look at the genealogies of Ham, uh, some of the descendants include the Cushites, or what has sometimes been translated as the Ethiopia, as the Ethiopians. But Ham isn't directly cursed. It seems to be Canaan that's cursed. So there's a question whether Ham is cursed or Canaan's curse. Ham uh, reminds us of the Hebrew word for hot. And so later people, Christians as Jews, uh, said, well, uh, Ham is like of the darker, you know, regions or the hotter regions where people have darker skin. Um, the end of the story, though, is that uh, the Black Africans are considered by Christian slavers and the few Jewish slavers as well as descendant of Ham, and thus they are part of a cursed race deserving of slavery. Um, this has a very uh, creepy afterlife, as I'm pointing out. And the other thing is that it also gets collapsed into another story from Genesis, a story about uh, an, an earlier curse that you know about, the curse of Cain uh, after he kills Abel. So uh, along with the curse of Ham or Canaan or and or Canaan, we have an er the first curse in the Bible uh, where Cain uh, kills Abel and, and God um, is not happy. Uh, notice the similarity in sound, Cain, Canaanite. Uh, and so to Christians, these stories were collapsed together and I'll show you here how. Now, if you go back to Genesis four, in the curse of Cain for killing his brother Abel, uh, the, if you see there on, in verse 15, uh, the, the Lord puts a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So that mark was interpreted by some Christian exegetes as black skin, although the text obviously doesn't say what the mark is, you know, a red X uh, or, you know, a scar or something. Uh, the, the interpretation that fills in the ambiguity is one in which anti uh, is is that of blackness. So the curse of Cain is of black skin, then gets associated with the curse of Ham here, depicted as a black uh, Egyptian or African, um, and that seals the deal for racist readings of the curse of Ham. Now uh, I want to maintain that these are just myths of origins originally just like in Genesis 19, where we have um, this farcical episode of, of uh, Lot and his daughters thinking they're the only ones left alive and the, the daughters commit incest with the father uh, and their kids become the ancestors of these other local tribes that the Israelites seem to be making fun of here in the Bible, um, that uh, the, the uh, product of incest or the ancestors explicitly, here's the Bible saying it, of the Moabites uh, and of the Ammonites. Um, you also have later in Genesis 25, uh, God saying to uh, Rebekah, two nations are in your womb and the description of Esau as having a specific kind of character. He will be a wild man, his body will be hairy and he will be the ancestor of the Edomites. So these, what we're looking at here are myths of origins about different peoples. Now, I don't think this is necessarily racist in the modern period, uh, way of thinking about it. This is more like the fanciful tales that the peoples of the world tell about 
how those yokels on the other side of the river came to be. And so we can't take this super seriously. What happens though is centuries later is that Christian exegetes will take the Bible as a guide to understanding the peoples of the world, uh, the races of the world, and will justify social setups based on their reading of the Bible. So I want to say that what we're looking at originally is just tribal politics. I will call this tribal trash talk. Uh, it's it's a fantasy justifying current social conditions at the time of Canaanite subordination or the tribal um, sort of dissing that one tribe might or one people might have over another. Um, but later it gets these stories, which are myths of origins, I'm, I'm insisting, get incorporated into the chauvinistic needs of capital, conquest, and domination, slavery, racism, and colonialism. Um, so uh, I want to point out too that um, the, the idea that Black people are the descendants of Ham is also taken up by Christian converts, uh, African Christian converts in the United States or in the Americas. And, and so sometimes you'll get 19th century ministers saying, we are the children of Ham. But what they do is they do another Bible reading to, to flip the, the status uh, and to critique the current institution of slavery by saying, okay, uh, we're the descendants of Ham, uh, however, uh, slavery in the Old Testament is only supposed to be for certain generations. Uh, or there's another way of exegeting this by saying that we are the descendants of Ham, but we're not the descendants of Canaan. Uh, Ham's other children are our ancestors, not Canaan. So the curse doesn't go through uh, all of Canaan's, excuse me, all of Ham's children, just Canaan. So Black interpreters then push back on the uh, curse of Ham racism by saying the institution of slavery is wrong. Now, another way this curse of Ham is used is also by Christian explorers in the early modern period to make claims about who these Native Americans are in the Americas. They look at the Native Americans uh, and they see them as Canaanites uh, and that they, the explorers, are kind of the new Israel because they're Christian. Uh, and so that justifies the subordination, the land grabbing, uh, the discrimination that happens. But I think we have to be very careful and to think we shouldn't be thinking that the Hebrew Bible is the origins of racism, the Old Testament, the origins of racism, because what you're doing is these interpreters are reaching into the Bible to weave a theological justification for why they're doing what they're doing. They're reaching into the Bible as a way of understanding these other people, these other people that they are enslaving or dominating or um, wiping out. There are other passages in the Bible that are uh, contrary to this racist reading. Uh, just on the, on the surface here, we have an incident in Numbers 11 on the top there where Miriam uh, talks against Moses' Cushite wife. Um, the Cushites being descendants of Ham, right? And that the, the, uh, uh, the punishment for Miriam speaking out is God making her skin uh, sickly white, one of the few episodes of skin color description in the entire Bible. Now, I should point out, none of these people in the Bible you're reading are white. They're all Middle Easterners. Uh, probably people from the South are a little more darker, uh, but um, maybe the Kushites are East Africans or very dark um, South, uh, um, uh, South Middle Easterns. Uh, you have verses in, in the Hebrew Bible talking about God uh, holding the Israelites in the same regard as the Kushites, the Ethiopians, as in Amos. Uh, you have the Song of Songs making another rare reference to skin color where the voice of the woman is saying, I am dark but lovely. Um, that, that darkness might be skin color. It might be because she's poor and she has to work out in the fields and so is not as aristocratic staying inside. Now, what can we learn about all um, this is that these texts from the Hebrew Bible 
have their meaning of what they were probably trying to do when they were originally assembled, edited, canonized, re read or heard and absorbed in the closer to the times in which they are constructed. The curse of Ham, which inexplicably curses Canaan, in, in my view, was probably the a emendation of an original curse narrative or myth, which then becomes the justification for Canaanite domination. So it's intertribal politics, tribal trash talk, not about anti-Black racism. What happens during the modern period, though, is that that curse is taken up by uh, European explorers, traders, uh, as a way of justifying why we are enslaving or conquering these particular people, whether it's Native Americans, but what it comes to be known as, as a justification for anti-Black uh, slavery, domination, and racism, partially because that curse of Ham or curse of Canaan is collapsed and, and merged with the curse of Cain from earlier in Genesis. Uh, but I have to emphasize that, again, these are texts that are then used for racist purposes. They do not cause the racism. Uh, they, the, the peoples of Europe encounter non-white people in the Americas or in Africa, and they have certain labor needs. They have needs about land, needs about who's going to do the work, uh, needs about conquest of territory. And then they use those myths to explain why it is that they're, they are allowed to do what they're doing. So if we want to be anti-racist readers of the Bible, uh, we cannot merely allow the Bible to be read with uh, a sort of our own prejudices in mind. We have to understand the Bible in its context of its composition, editing, and reception. And we also have to understand that long terrible history in which people already engaged in the act of racism and colonialism are reaching back into the Bible to justify what, um, what they need. Anti-racist verses are already there in the Bible, verses that talk about the universality of all humankind, uh, verses that hold up uh, Ethiopians and others as equal. Uh, verses that hold up the non-Israelites peoples as noble. So the Bible speaks with different tendencies. On one hand, these peoples are, can be made fun of and caricatured, but on the other hand, the peoples are given dignity and they become part of the holy history of the people of Israel. Um, so I'm looking forward to our conversation and uh, I will see you soon. Thanks for listening.